she to me is the epitome of a focused life. I call her the, the 20th century St. Francis of Assisi. And she's a modern day heroine. She didn't live in the past. Uh, she's a, a woman who lived the path completely. And she just had perfect protection all those years. A woman walking through the desert at night or through the slums of cities, a woman. I thought it was, she was a kook. She was gone. I mean, I didn't, I thought there was something really wrong with this woman. I would have been a disciple, but she made it very clear that she, she did not want any followers. There was no sham, no pretense. Um, there's nothing false about her. That's so rare these days. Everything about her really, I think, was unique. I never knew anybody else like that. This person must be some kind of a nut. You see, there was this, this simplicity about her. Rare, rare, rare person. She would be the type of person you would like to be when you grew up. She is the singular person that I have known who found that kingdom within, who lived in a different dimension. The power of a life like that is incredible. pilgrim, a wanderer. And a pilgrim is a wanderer with a purpose. My pilgrimage is for peace. Peace among nations, peace among groups, peace with our environment, but also peace among individuals and the very, very important inner peace, which is what I talk about the most. Peace, let me ask you this. Uh, was it always Peace Pilgrim, or did you have a name as a little girl? I came from a very quiet life. I was born on a small farm on the outskirts of a small town. I had a woods to play in and a creek to swim in and room to grow. We were in the country. We uh, had a poultry farm. And of course, we also raised all our own vegetables. We were nine, six adults and three children. My mother and father, and my father's three maiden aunties and bachelor uncle. Then my sister, Peace Pilgrim, my brother, Al, and myself. And Mildred was uh, six and a half years older than myself, and three years older than my brother. I guess I looked up to her son, you know, she was older than I was and she was very competent. Mildred was pretty even tempered as far as I can remember. I set priorities in my life uh, from the time that I was a child. Now this taught me self-discipline and it led to a very orderly life. I still have priorities in my life today. Mildred was popular and she was very, uh, a very good student. She had an excellent mind and she was always at the top of her class. Even then she was a good speaker. She was on the debating team in high school. And she had pretty much the gift of the gab, you know. <laughs> From the first that I knew her, which was of course in high school, uh, she was a dynamic person. She was uh, not, not only a, uh, at that time already, she showed promise of being an excellent speaker, but she was devoid of all fear. 
and she would tell the audience exactly what she thought. I began to make some good choices when I was still quite young. And the golden rule influenced my life. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. It was different from anything I had ever read because it received an inner confirmation from me and affected my entire life. I carried it into high school with my little saying, if you want to make friends, you must be friendly. And that's an offshoot of the golden rule, a recognition that people react according to the influences brought to bear upon them. I don't remember her ever being religious as a, as a, as a young girl. We had no religious upbringing formally, but we uh, were taught the Ten Commandments and uh, we were taught to live them. And uh, we sort of developed a consciousness, a conscience. If we did something wrong, our conscience would bother us. She loved nature, that's, an, that's another thing. And she was very knowledgeable as far as uh, uh, the names of plants. She loved animals. We had innumerable animals around us. She was active, you know. She could climb trees and something of a tomboy, I guess you, we used to call them in those days. She could out climb me and swim or anything like that, you know. She was, she was always at the diving hole and uh, doing things that the, the others weren't doing. She was, she, was, uh, she was very much a daredevil because not only did she do these things in our swimming pool, but she would go down to the river, Mullica River, seven miles away, and uh, she would dive off of the bridge. When I was still in what they would call junior high today, I was offered real cigarettes, which I did not smoke, but my friends did. In high school, I was offered all kinds of alcohol, which I did not drink, but my friends did. And gathered in someone's living room, I said to them, look, life is a series of choices. Nobody can stop you from making your choices, but I have a right to make my choices too. And I have chosen freedom. She graduated from high school in 1926. And uh, due to the lack of finances, she had limited possibilities. She took the uh, commercial course in high school because it would fit her for a job as a secretary. Her first job was with the Liberty Cut Glassworks. I think she was making the huge sum of $22 a week or something like that, and I was making, I started off with 15 She, of course, went out and bought herself a, uh, a beautiful set of furniture, which hardly was suitable in our house, which was very plain. Also uh, had uh, furs and, and things like that that seemed a little bit out of our uh, Class, you know. She was the first to come out with a one-piece bathing suit uh, because, uh, of course, all of uh, the Andes and all they wore these uh, with the little ruffled uh, skirts and so forth. I, I don't see anything eccentric about her when she was young. That, she did what all the girls did in those days. There was a period when Mildred was, the, I can remember one picture in particular stands out in my mind where she was very much the flapper. She loved to dance, I remember that. She had several boyfriends that used to take her down to the piers in Atlantic City and they'd dance. She wouldn't just have dresses and shoes. It would be a coordinated outfit. And then she knows how to pose and turn like a good a garbo, you know, and all that sort of thing, yeah. I think she was more fashionable than average for a small town. I got the impression that one gets in this materialistic age that the way to get on well in the world was to get out there and make a lot of money and get ahead of the other fellow. And during the early years of my life, I discovered that money making was easy. 
but not satisfy. I never knew of a steady boyfriend. And we didn't even know that she was going with Stanley in the beginning. Well, I guess I was about 17 at a dance. Somebody introduced her to me at a dance. Mildred was a nice looking girl. She wasn't Jean Harlow, but on the other hand, she wasn't Joan Rivers either, so. <laughs> I think, of course, it was my first steady girlfriend. And I guess that I, while she had gone out with other men, I think I was her first steady boyfriend. You know, I mean, day in, day out, week in, week out. Mildred didn't drink, incidentally, except one time when I sort of uh, uh, slipped one over on her and she, she drank a Tom Collins and didn't know what she was drinking. I thought it was lemonade. <laughs> Actually, we, as personalities at that particular time, we were pretty close. Uh, it was a cold, uh, wintry day. It was in February. They went out and uh, on a ride, and uh, in those days there was no heat in cars, you know, and it got pretty cold, and uh, she was complaining about her feet being cold, and she was cold and all, and he said, well, you know, he would keep them warm for her, and they got, why didn't they get married? So they went to Elkton. And I guess maybe she suggested we get married. Um, probably she did, because uh, being two and a half years older than I was, she probably led me down and right into some decisions that were made which were not my decisions. Uh, I guess the fact that the first few years when we were married and just being together was enough. You know, the uh, the problems hadn't hadn't arisen yet. I mean, at least they hadn't become important. He was young and uh, younger than Heath Pilgrim, and. Uh, a little immature, I guess, and he was trying hard to to make a, fa a fast buck in the days of depression when it just was very difficult. Uh, there just wasn't any money around. There was no work around. There was no money. You had to scratch. And uh, he got himself into a little trouble at times, and uh, he was always borrowing and uh, writing rubber checks and so forth. Much as I can remember, I had enjoyed his company. He and I sort of wrapped together. We used to do a little drinking together from time to time, which I, that was one thing that I think Mildred didn't approve of. Well, they had their arguments because with the, some of the dumb things, I guess, that Stanley did and Mildred didn't approve of, and then again, there were things that he probably expected of her that she wasn't uh, coming through with, like being a good housewife and uh, you know, she just wasn't so inclined. She just wasn't a homemaker, that's all there was to it. No way, shape, or form that she was she a homemaker. And that's what I wanted. I wanted a home and family. Children were not ever in her lifestyle. She didn't have the mother instinct, I think, that most women have. Well, she didn't know herself what she wanted when we were together. And during the years that we lived together, uh, she really didn't have a goal. The goal was, I mean, naturally, I mean, a broad thing. Uh, she wanted to know war and peace. She often, like I said, she wanted me to go to prison rather than go into service. She would come to visit me, and uh, of course I didn't. I, I didn't volunteer, but when I was drafted, I went and I served. When he was drafted into the service, she wouldn't have anything to do with it. He had asked her, this I know, that he, he had asked her to go with him to the camp. And she wrote me a letter back that as long as I was in the service, she would not go to visit me. She would not have anything to do with me as living with me. And she absolutely, in fact, I had taken that letter to my commanding officer, and he said, you know, that's grounds for divorce. She didn't want the divorce, but she, she did it anyhow, because I told her, either, either one way or another, you're going to get me divorced. The few tears that came out of her eyes when we met with the lawyer didn't bother me too much, because I didn't feel that she was really, had she been, had, well, I couldn't, and I had, 
gone too far to change my mind. When the divorce was over, then there was no ties. They did one thing for her, let her live her life the way she wanted. Out of a feeling of deep seeking for a meaningful way of life, I began to walk one night through the woods with the feeling that I would continue to walk until I found what I was seeking. And after I had walked almost all night, I came out into a clearing where the moonlight was shining down. And I found myself saying, if you can use me for anything, please use me. And I found myself feeling here I am, take all of me, use me as you will, I withhold nothing. And then, of course, I felt I had found what I was seeking. I experienced the complete willingness, without any reservations whatsoever, to give my life to something beyond myself. But then I discovered that there is a great difference between the willingness to give and the actual giving. In my life, 15 years lay between. Crazy Aunt Mildred. I overheard a lot of the, the family, the family gossip, sure, you know, talking about, uh, you know, sort of the things that, unconventional things that she was doing. And I think she worked in Philadelphia during the war, during the Second World War doing some peace work. You might want to cut this. I don't know if they've told you about the days when she was a nudist. She, what, she, first she said, you know, can I just sunbathe out on the lawn, you know, al fresco or whatever. And my mother, everybody's, oh my God, you know, don't, don't you dare, you know, ah, what's she doing now? And this is all through this period when she was doing this, you know, the dietary things, the, you know, everything. The older generation in my family, some of them, they used to think she was just nuts. And they'd say, what is she doing now, you know? And then she started her hiking. And she was actually the first woman ever to hike the um, entire Appalachian Trail. And I know she used to, when she was in those hiking days, she'd always bring home a couple of like people that she hiked with, you know, sort of stray people. She'd always pick up stray people all over the place. Maybe there were people she was sort of helping. She used to, you know, just talk to a lot of people. It just seems like she was training herself, trying to make, make herself hardy and able to uh, withstand all sorts of conditions, even before she had any idea of becoming a peace pilgrim. She had severed her old relationships. The uh, local people didn't go along with her, family didn't go along with her, and she just brushed that aside. This was more important. I experienced what seemed like a struggle between two cells, which the psychologist would call ego and conscience, which the religious person would call self-will and God's will, uh, which I often call in my everyday words, the lower self and the higher self. Well, she decided she was going to work for peace, but she wasn't content. She was a, a little irritated, irritating. And in the midst of the struggle between these two viewpoints, I caught my first glimpse of the life of harmony, the life of inner peace. When she first came to the Jane Addams house, she was a discontent person. And when she became Peace Pilgrim, she was happy. She found her niche. I saw in my mind's eye myself walking along and wearing the garb of my mission, I just needed to duplicate it. 
I saw in my mind's eye a map of the United States with the large cities marked in, and it looked as though someone had taken a colored crayon and marked a route across from Los Angeles to New York City, coast to coast and border to border, which was my first pilgrimage route. a pilgrim uh, walks on faith. I have no money. I don't accept any money. I belong to no organization. There is no organizational backing behind me. And I own only uh, what I wear and just the few things I carry in my little pockets. I just walk until given shelter, fast until given food. I don't even ask. It's given without asking. Aren't people good? You walk this country of ours without so much as a penny in your pocket. You just walk on faith alone, faith that somebody will take care of you. And it always seems to happen. You must have some intuition as to uh, who to approach and who to smile to and who is going to be good to you, though, don't you? I smile to everyone. I never approach anyone. And those who come are very special. They're either genuinely interested in peace or they have a good, lively curiosity. I think I first heard about Peace Pilgrim over television. I think she was being interviewed. I worked at a Howard Johnson's restaurant waitressing in Plattsburgh, New York. So when Peace Pilgrim came, it just happened that she got sad at one of my stations. She just had this beautiful, placid look in her eyes. I, almost, I still get teary thinking about this, because it means a lot to me. I noticed this person walking down the, the uh, road that she was going the office direction that I was, and I said I never picked up hitchhikers. Uh, something intuitively within me drove me to do this, and I remember so vividly reaching across the car door and opening the door for peace, and very spontaneously I said, I think you have something that I want. This is the way to peace. Overcome evil with good and falsehood with truth and hatred with love. Please don't say lightly that these are just religious concepts and not practical. These are laws governing human conduct which apply as rigidly as the law of gravity. When we disregard these laws in any walk of life, chaos results. I was just tremendously impressed. I mean, at that time, I was raising a family, and I probably I was sort of wishing that I were doing what she was doing, and, and that I wasn't raising a family and coping with all of the problems. But she just had total faith, and I mean, fear just wasn't even a piece of her. <laughs> I was just thrilled that here was somebody so devoted to peace that she would do what she was doing. Because I was profoundly concerned about peace. I just wanted us to have a world for our children to grow up in. My first reaction was, she was talking about peace, and um, I, had, I had read many spiritual classics, and so what she said was very similar to what I had already read. So I said to her, well, why are you walking around the country? You, you, there's nothing new. And she said, she agreed with me. When I started out, things were very different, actually. Uh, I can remember the Korean War was on at that time, and it was the height of the McCarthy era. There was such fear at that time, and therefore great apathy, because the safest thing to do is nothing. We don't know the urgency of her message that was prevalent in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I mean, it's, it's a different world now. 
we all feared a World War III. I feared for our, my son and everyone else that I knew, and I tried to introduce as many young men of drafting age to her so they would find out how to avoid the draft even if they had to go to jail. Peace Pilgrim, you know, there are a certain number of people who uh, would not even think of doing this that would probably think of somebody like yourself as a kook or a nut. The question I had before I met her was, this person must be some kind of a nut. Who would want to go around dressed like that? When you're praying for a guru, you're praying for a teacher, and then all of a sudden you come confronted with a, an old lady with tennis shoes, you know, with an old battered tunic saying, Peace Pilgrim, speaking in a squeaky voice and hanging around with all these old people. I just felt that this wasn't going to work out. That, that was my first impression, that it really wasn't going to work out, that I blew it again. My driver, the representative, he thought she was just a, an ordinary person, and he completely dismissed her as being of non-importance. There was an announcement that we were going to have a speaker, a woman that spoke about peace, and she wore a blue tunic, and she called herself the Peace Pilgrim. And I remember hearing that description and thinking, she sure sounds flaky to me. I don't, I don't think I really cared for her. I may have felt sorry for her, but I didn't care for her. She never really inspired me that uh, she's doing great work. I just thought there's something wrong with this woman. But I did go to hear her. And within a few moments, or a few minutes of hearing her speak, I, I, I saw she was not flaky. She was very down to earth, very present, and very level-headed. But I very quickly realized she was anything but a nut. She seemed just as normal as anybody could seem. We spent 10 hours at the railroad station talking, one-on-one, -on -one. me and her. I went in with skeptical. I bombarded her with questions. I never let up. And at the end of the 10 hours, my doubts were allayed. I felt that I don't have to go any further. This is it. This is what I've been looking for. Well, I'm quite sure that some of those who have just heard of me must think I'm completely off the beam. After all, I am doing something different, and pioneers have always been uh, looked upon as being a bit strange. But you see, I love people, and I see the good in them, and you're apt to reach what you see. I just liked her her essence right away. She was almost like a stand-up person, although she was seated. And I mean, you, when you go in a room, if there's one person standing and everybody else is seated, you, you gravitate to that person who's standing. Well, she was outstanding, let's put it that way, well, while she was seated. I said, this is a mystic. And I didn't know what a mystic was, but I said, that is a mystic. She just exuded health. The, the energy was there, but she was just healthy. And the expression on her face and in her eyes that there was, that she certainly had achieved the peace. I, I find it really difficult to, to describe what I saw because what I saw was, went a lot beyond physical. One of the most difficult things to do with peace was to give her something. And I had to trick her. And when she would come to see me, We'd have, a, we'd have an argument. Peace, you need new shoes. No, they'll last a little bit longer. Peace, you need new shoes. Those are terrible. They're going to fall off your feet. No, I, it, well, we can wait. And uh, it's I mean, sneaky. I'd go into a, 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 a mall, drive and say, hey, Mark, come with me, Peace. Where are you going? Well, I'm going over here for a moment. Go right up to the place where she has to buy the shoes. And I said, Peace, there's your shoes. She carried a ballpoint pen, and I gave her stamps. And when she only asked me, and I said, oh, I have a lot of stamps. She said, oh, I need three stamps. I mean, like, I don't need a dozen stamps. I need three stamps. Extra fourth stamp would be a burden, you know? Where am I going to put it? It'll get damp in my pocket or something, you know? I offered her the apple, and she said, are you trying to spoil my connections? It's about like that. 
And I said, well, no, I just thought you'd like to have an apple. She said, I'll be fed. Went off down the road. I first walked from Los Angeles to New York, from coast to coast and from border to border, in a zigzag pattern across the country. That was my first 5,000 miles. However, I didn't even touch half of the states on that journey. So for my second 5,000 miles, I have set out to walk 100 miles in each state into the state capital, plus 100 miles in Mexico and 100 miles in Canada. I first heard of Peace Bogum in 1957 when she was walking through Canada. She was walking 100 miles in every province. They stopped her at the border going into Canada and um, weren't going to let her in because she didn't have any money. And uh, so she said, but, but uh, what would uh, happen if I were Jesus? And uh, the man said, well, of course, you know, we have these regu regulations, and you know how they are. And her sister sent her some money. And um, then when she got across the border, she sent the money back to her sister. We had a lot of fun with her. Peace Pilgrim said she doesn't carry a penny in her pockets. And so our daughter, to play a trick on her, put a penny in her tunic pocket. What impressed me was her, was her inner peace, not her, not her great knowledge of science. Many people say, oh, they're seeking, they're searching, but she said, I've found. Now that's very unusual. I never, I never ran across a person before that said, I have found inner peace. I was very unhappy at her because I wanted her to stay Longer, she was just there for a day and a night, and I thought, here she was a pilgrim, a free, a free as the wind, and um, of course she could stay longer, but uh, she had speaking engagements arranged across Canada. of 1964, I had finished counting 25,000 miles. And I thought, that's enough, no more counting. So when I started my pilgrimage, my priorities were walking first, then speaking, then answering mail. But as soon as I stopped counting, I switched priorities, and my priorities became speaking first, then answering mail, and then walking. And those are my priorities today. She gave a talk at St. John's College here in Santa Fe, and I did a story for the, uh, for the newspaper. And though I was there as a reporter, I also was intrigued by her, by her life. The fact that she wasn't just talking about peace, but the fact that she was living what she, living what she was talking about. Her lifestyle fascinated me, as I think it did a lot of people. Uh, I don't care whether it was a churlish type of a question that came from the audience or uh, something that was aimed at demeaning uh, what she was. She was absolutely in control, and she was expressing herself in the sim most simplistic way that she could. She was direct. Her message was direct. It was a singular message.
the basic conflict in our world today is not between nations. It is between two opposing beliefs. The belief that you can overcome evil with more evil. And of course, those people are busy multiplying the evil. Now, this is the official position of every major nation in the world. This is the war way. And the belief, which is my way, and I'm sure it's your way, I'm sure many people relate to this, the belief that evil can only be overcome by good. I was timid about calling people, and I was timid. I thought, oh, I don't know who to call. And I would tell her, and she'd say, oh, mignon, you know, oh, dear. And then she would just go over to the telephone and start dialing and looking in the book, and pretty soon she'd have everything full. She would just say, this is Peace Pilgrim. I'm walking for 25,000 miles for peace, and I would like to have an opportunity to speak on your radio. Well, I'd say, OK. Who wouldn't if you were walking 25,000 miles for peace? She talked to various churches on the telephone and introduced herself, and she'd made seven different appointments to put on a, an, appear, put an appearance in seven different Anchorage churches. And so in anticipation of her first meeting, we put peace in the car. And we have a one hectic time running her with minutes to spare from this meeting to that meeting. And peace was not at ease. And either were, it wasn't a peaceful time for any of us. <laughs> she started by giving a brief talk, describing what she was doing and why she was doing it. And then, uh, rather quickly, she tried to engage the class in discussion. Just think uh, they were trying to challenge her, and she enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, if there was a real uh, challenge in what they were saying, she responded to it with sort of a glee. Uh, so they were sort of no a money, happy, excited, give and take with the students. I, I think they all felt she's a little strange, but uh, they liked her. I'm sure they liked her. You couldn't help but liking her. Peace Pilgrim had the abilities of a stand-up comedian in how she would handle hecklers or challengers. She knew how to disarm people. Sometimes people would make assumptions about her. They would say, okay, this is a person involved in the peace movement. Here's how I can get their goat. Here's where they're going to have a rigid position. And then Peace Pilgrim would turn out not to have as rigid a position, a rigid a stance on things as they imagined. It was like she had never talked about these things before and that we were being graced with these inner words that were just coming from her very spontaneously. I asked her about it. I said, you know, this is the third one I've heard piece. You just did them all exactly right, exactly the same. You didn't miss a... She said it was given to me. She said that she was walking, and she didn't know how to, how to speak in public. And she was walking, and the whole thing was given to her. And she said, I've just never changed it. One of the things we're just coming to realize is that we create through thought. We constantly create through thought. We create our inner conditions. We help to create the conditions around us. Now, if you're fearful, what will happen? You will attract the things you fear. I fear nothing and expect only good. So to me, only good comes. But then, of course, I'm always thinking about the best that could happen and all the good things that I want to see happen because those are the things I want to emphasize. She recognized everything as an energy expression. She was so enchanting in talking about the energy that is manifesting into this tree, this flower, this growing um, expression, whatever it might be. She had this tremendous uh, awareness of anything that grew, and she loved flowers. She not only saw the beauty, she would cup her hands, she never would pick a flower, she'd cup her hands around it to uh, uh, study the flower and appreciate the beauty of it. But she also was seeing that unique quality of energy that was manifesting into this flower, the, uh, that life spark that is as energized into this particular product just as we are.
We all met in Seattle, Washington, at the airport. And people flew from all over the country, as I knew they were going to. And now this was to be an inspirational and educational tour of Alaska. It's just a beautiful retreat situation. We're together for a couple of weeks amid beautiful surroundings, and everybody comes back inspired and uplifted, everyone ready to work for their good cause. <laughs> we got to Alaska, and we realized that she really hadn't planned this trip out at all. She was taking us on a sightseeing tour. My husband, Andy, and I kept saying, well, peace, you know, this is, this is great, you know, it's beautiful and everything, but, you know, we want to hear you talk more. And she said, oh, uh, you would like to, me to talk more to the group? And we said, yes. And so she said, well, okay. <laughs> um, how about we'll, uh, we'll get together as a group in the morning and in the evening. So we said, well, that's great. And, and then we also started, uh, we drew names so that everyone had an opportunity to spend an hour alone walking with her, which was great because we all got to address the areas, you know, that we were interested in. I was always asking her questions, whatever would fly through my head. I was like a little kid, just wanting to know what her opinion was on whatever it is. He said to her one day, um, well, peace, why do we have to buy our food? Um, why can't we live on, on faith like you do? I mean, we came on this trip to experience the way you live. You don't go out and buy your food. You know, we want to live on faith like you do. And she would, you know, try to explain, well, now, Andy, you know, there's a big difference here. We're traveling with 18 people, and, you know, there's this and that. But, and he wouldn't let up. Now, peace, you, you know, this was an experience of living the way you do now. I don't see why we can't live on faith. And so after going back and forth with him several times, she finally looked at him and she said, Andy, if you want to walk on faith, you'll have to walk on your own. You can't walk on mine. She didn't tell us that stinker, but we didn't live on faith on food, but we lived on faith regarding lodging, which means she was winging it by the seat of her pants there too. Some people were, were, got aggravated when uh, it was 8 o'clock at night and we still didn't know we were going to sleep. <laughs> there were times, I remember we went to a campground and um, there was big signs there, no camping. And uh, he says, we're camping here. And a couple of the people come up and said, peace, you know, it says no camping here. You know, how can we disobey the law? And she said, oh, don't worry. We're not camping. We're just going to sleep. So I remember Andy B. went up to the ranger and, and uh, said, <laughs> we're going to, would it be okay if we stay here tonight? We're 18 people, we're on a peace trip, we're a peace pilgrim, this and that. And he said, no, you know, and, and uh, he came back and he told Peace that he went up to the, and she says, what did you do, you know? And she said, oh no. She said, don't ask. <laughs> if you ask, they have to say no. It's their, you know, it's the regulation. Peace believed in the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. Um, there was a big debate between the grumblers, the, the letter of the loss, who were saying, well, what's the matter with her anyway, thinking that we could camp where we're not supposed to camp? I mean, you know, rules are rules. And then there were those of us who were saying, the spirit of the law. Gee, I like that. <laughs> I said, you must have secrets. You must have certain things. You know, this just isn't your whole message, you know. And she kept insisting, I don't have secrets. I said, you've got to have secrets. Please tell me, you know, what, what, you know, what's your secret? I'm, I'm looking. Finally, she said, I have a secret. But I would not call it that. There was a time, long ago, when I died, utterly died to myself. If you have a problem with a proper attitude, 
you can not only solve that problem, but you can learn and grow through solving it. Problems are really wonderful learning and growing experiences, and that applies not only to personal problems, but also to collective problems. If you see uh, we would solve our collective problems, we would discover that we had done a great deal of learning and growing. The Hawaii trip was organized um, somewhat differently in that uh, she had learned from the Alaska trip more what the desires of the people with her were, which is to share more of her stories and, and her insights and her wisdom in some of the more, you know, in a more esoteric sense than her general message. There's a, a spot on the island of Kauai. It's called the Fern Grotto. You have to get there by boat along a broad river. And the tour company has someone playing guitar, singing Hawaiian songs. And just spontaneously, Peace Pilgrim got up and started dancing. And immediately get into all of the hula movements and was just having a great time. She was completely, completely drawn right into it. I, this is the first time I saw Peace Pilgrim dance. And uh, she was, her face was filled with delight. She was thoroughly enjoying herself. Peace Pilgrim had a great capacity for fun. The Peace Pilgrim group went over to tour the grounds of the Mormon uh, temple. And before the tour began, they asked us to sign a book with our name and address and asked us what our religion was. So people were, were fascinated to see what Peace Pilgrim wrote down was her religion. So after everyone got through signing the book, we, a couple of us, dashed back and took a peek. And what Peace Pilgrim had written under What is Your Religion, she wrote, Universal Truth. Peace would give her wonderful talk about how um, all of her needs were answered and she never asked. And that was absolutely true. But she had a way of getting her needs known. And uh, she had said something like, there are some people I would probably like to, to, to send postcards to, but of course I don't have any. But she didn't ask. Part of um, Cheryl and I's job you know, with, with Peace Program as her helpers would be to wake her up. She was a uh, very deep sleeper. I remember shaking her and shaking her and shaking her. You know, every, everybody was, was, was touching her, you know, and I says, oh, let's, let's get her up, you know. I shook her as hard as I can and, and, you know, she would wake up. This night we settled her in this beautiful white sandy cove and went on down the beach and the next morning came back to wake her up and as we walked uh, into the area where she was, we were just astounded to see this beautiful yellow flower had sprung up right beside her head where she was sleeping. There were no other flowers on the beach and it was a completely sandy beach. You know, there were no, how does something grow in the sand? We said, peace, look at that flower there. It grew right by your head. She says, oh, there's a rational explanation for everything. And she just turned and walked away. We just looked and stared at it. We went out and got a, a picture of it. I like to think of it as the miracle flower, you know, but if I would say that to Peace, she'd give me a kick in the rear. You didn't walk to Hawaii, though. Oh, I'm not quite up to that <laughs> yet. Maybe in a little while, but not quite now. It requires a little more growing. On the way back from Hawaii, I mean, I sat with her. I had the, somehow we got to sit the whole way back, the five hours. And at that time, she was looking uh, at a book that Andy Zupko had written about her or that was inspired by her. So the, the last visual impression of Peace Pilgrim is sitting on that airplane next to Andy Zupko, looking through, uh, looking through the manuscript of his book. It perhaps uh, a known to us intimation of things to come. When I started out, people accepted war as a necessary part of life. Now they're looking for alternatives to war, and this is a game. When I started out, there was very little interest in the inner search. 
Now there's an almost universal interest in the inner search, which to me is the greatest gain of all. Now there is darkness in our world today. It's quite natural. It's due to the disintegration of things which are contrary to the law of love. They cannot endure. They contain within themselves the seeds of their own destruction. So let us look at these things in proper perspective, and we will see that amid the darkness there is also some light. I said, well, peace, what's going to happen when you die? What are they going to do with your body? Oh, don't even talk about that. I says, no, we have to talk about it. I want to talk about it. You know? She says, well, one of two things. They're either going to cremate me, they're going to take my body and they're going to cut it up and they're going to use it in a laboratory, or I don't know what. They'll just bury me in a pauper's grave. Whatever happens, happens. But I'm, it's just my body. It's just my outer covering. It's just, it's just some old clothes that I'm getting rid of. And that last night she was here, she did what many people felt was a wonderful healing experience. And many people noticed that she kept looking up during her talk with the people. And finally, she just came down the steps and, and started moving around through the congregation that was there. And she just would reach out and just touch people and say, bless you, and go to the next and all. Walked around, and there wasn't a sound in the room. And when it was all over, she walked back up and she looked up again and she said, I never say goodbye, but this has been a very special night for me and I just want to bless all of you and, and I'll be seeing you. And many, many people came to me and said, you know, she looked very different, but what was she looking at? The night before that, she and I had sat for a long time and just talked. And she had never talked about death before. Well, ne neither one of us had. And she said, you know, I want you to join me in prayer. This is really what I want to ask of you tonight, that when my work here on this planet Earth is done, that I move out like that, that I go very quickly. She was alive for a while, she wasn't killed instantly, but she didn't really seem like she was hurt that bad, but probably internally. When we were planning to have her come here, uh, I was just absolutely sure she'd come. She's been so protected every other place, after all, it was her seventh pilgrimage. We waited, and each day we'd run to the mailbox, and each day the mailbox was empty. No letter from Peace Pilgrim. Well, I got a phone call from my husband uh, at work, and he came to pick me up. And of course, it was a shock. I just didn't think that. I had no, I just always felt that she was going to outlive me. And when I first read that note, I thought, my God, did someone shoot her? You know, I didn't know how she died. It just the note just said, Peace Pilgrim killed. And I could not, I could not take in what I was reading, that Peace Pilgrim had been killed, that Peace Pilgrim had been killed. I was overcome. I, I, I read the letter and I, I couldn't even talk. I handed it to uh, the two Andes and I, I walked out of the house to go for a walk and be alone. It was over. And after the phone call, we, we just put the receiver down and we just, I just, just think we looked at each other for a minute or two, just stunned. 
I, it, sometimes it happens like that. The world is going along fine, and suddenly it has changed. And when I read her letter, it was the world was different. It was a beautiful ceremony down at the Methodist Church. And they had asked us to speak for just a few minutes, and I remember I spoke longer than that because I had interviewed her. And I had so much that I, I, I wanted to share, and I don't know how long I talked, but I think it was longer than five minutes. And, um, and no one seemed to mind because we were just grieving. I celebrated when she died, the way she died because she lived in character, and she certainly was a character who did her own thing and believed in it. And she died on the road. She died the way she lived. That was a big blessing. That was a blessing from the heavens. I found her book in the library. I had a desire to read this book on Peace Pilgrim's Life. I read it right away, yep, cover to cover. And I remember, uh, not being able to put it down. This had been such a unique um, individual with such an inspiring and inspirational story to tell that it really needed to be told. Somehow the idea emerged, well, let's do a book only in her words. Peace believed that the truth should never be sold. So there was... Um, uh, a preponderance of opinion among the five compilers that this book should be made available free to anybody who wanted the book. And so we devised an experiment in which we had um, gathered uh, contributions that had been offered for getting a book together and we decided that we would offer that book free of charge and whenever we ran out of books and money that would be the end of our distribution. We figured we might have one printing, maybe two printings, but the money kept pouring in and the money kept pouring in and we kept reprinting it and reprinting it and reprinting it. And now it's a spiritual classic. It doesn't stop. Anne and John chose to take this on as their retirement project and they felt that there was nothing that they could do for the subject of peace that could ever be more important than the distribution of that book. Okay, uh, to our video, what else do you want? Books? Any books? We're, we're open all the time because this is our home. So, uh, any time. But just don't call in the middle of the night, that's all. We had 6,000 names uh, from Peace Pilgrim's mailing list, and so we sent out a notice to all those 6,000, uh, letting them know about the, uh, the book. When the first box of the books came, I was almost afraid to open it because it was just so exciting. It was just so overwhelming to open the box and see Peace Pilgrim walking again down the highway. Our retirement project has turned out to be our busiest time in our life. I said, beyond our expectations are just, we're just amazed at what's happened. You need to have in your life something inspirational, something that will lift you up and inspire you and awaken that higher nature uh, within you. Now, I believe, of course, that that's one of the functions, certainly, of a church service, to lift you up and inspire you, and of the arts and so on. Now, you also need a path of service, something you do to help somebody, because in this world you're given as you give. We were very busy sending out single books. Then they began wanting books to send to their, uh, give to their relatives and their friends, and they began ordering more and more and more books till, until now they, many, many people order uh, whole boxes of books. I've been teaching my peace courses for about eight or nine years and I've had 3,000 kids in my classes, so I've been using her book for, you know, for a good many years. I had reread the book and there were three things that Peace Pilgrim thought was important and that was your work and um, your area of service, which I had never given much thought to, and exercise. I didn't have an area of service 
And I remembered there was a nursing home in town, and so I found myself offering to go in and do a music sing-along. I go up there twice a month. I've been doing it for a year, and that's my area of service. I have a mission here. My purpose is to distribute um, Peace Pilgrim's book to as many congressmen and as many staff people who I feel confident will take the time and effort to read it. Oh, I just give them the book and say, and say dip into this and, and see where it leads you. And some kids are ready for it and some are not. And the teaching really gets you to understand that, uh, that every flower blooms when it's ready. I felt very, very inspired by Peace Pilgrim. I thought her message was really important. And I had this, uh, different ideas. At one point, I wrote to John and Ann, and I said, you know, what you should do is get the Steps book in Spanish. It took me three years to do it. And in many cases, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know how to translate something, yeah? And I almost could feel Peace Pilgrim right here telling me that's the way. And you know, and that means, yeah, all right, that's the way, keep going. <laughs> so it was, it was a fascinating process. And I had many jobs. We got the, uh, George Dolnikowski asked us if we wanted to do the Russian uh, steps and book. Naturally, I, I was very happy to see that Mira Lyubivaya Stranitsa, it's my translation, and that's what it is. Uh, that is, peace-loving pilgrim. Yeah. In, in Russia, there's an, a paper called Argumenti Facti, Arguments and Facts. And so Sergei had the bright idea of asking Argumenti Facti to announce to their 17 million readers that people could get free Russian language peace program materials and after a few days after it hit the stands, we got a call from Sergey. I said, well, how many requests have you gotten uh, from, uh, from the newspaper? He said, oh, so far we've gotten uh, 1,100. So he called back like a few days later. We, I've got 5,000 now. And then he called back later and he had 10,000. And it actually topped off at 21,500. And then uh, I asked them, uh, I said, did you ever think about sending books to the prison uh, libraries and the prison chaplains? I first heard about Peace Pilgrim when I was uh, still incarcerated in the ECHO unit. And it was very close to when I was going through, I believe, phase one of inner peace. The inner peace program that was put together basically took a lot of the Peace Pilgrim material, uh, which was furnished to us uh, uh, about three, well, almost four years ago, I guess. There was a simplicity that I admired. There was a directness, an honesty, and a courage to say the truth. And what this book helped me to do was to give me the most positive female role model I've ever come across. I would say that it, it is probably one of the, the best programs we have going. There definitely was an impact on all of the people. With this Inner Peace program in the years since, I believe, 1989, when it first began, to my knowledge, not one inmate has been re-arrested for any crime committed after learning inner peace. Not a single one. There's only one, one phrase that comes to mind when, when I think of what a summation of, of Peace Pilgrim's message is. The phrase that I hear is you can do it too. 
you can work for peace right where you are in your own surroundings. You can be a peacemaker, uh, uh, of course, wherever you are. And every time you succeed in bringing harmony into any inharmonious situation right where you are, you have made a contribution uh, to the total peace picture. So I would say you begin working in your own life, and when you have enough peace there, you begin working in your own surroundings. Eventually, you see, enough of us would have found enough inner peace to affect for the better our institutions. And then the better institutions will in turn, through better example, affect for the better those who are still immature. I think Steve was totally influenced by Peace Pilgrim and everything else he read and studied built on those same principles. But I think it was, it was his Bible, if you will, something he always went back to and I think that the Peace Pilgrim really affected, I'm not sure the movement would have happened without the guidance Steve got from Peace Pilgrim because that was what inspired him to do everything else he did. What is missing in the practice of law for the vast majority of people is a sense that what they're doing contributes. The paradigm for, pe for mediating is that you're peacemakers. Uh, there's a, a quality of doing good in mediating, of, of being a source of healing. Think win-win or no deal, that that's a rule of interpersonal relationships. Peace Pilgrim said it's got to be beneficial to everybody or it won't last. Jesus said, How did Steve Prochet find Peace Pilgrim? Pilgrim? I have no idea, but I'm awfully glad he did. This is not a new thought. Because it is the foundation of what we do every day as, as mediators. So he pulled out this little brochure. He said, you need this. You need to read this. Uh, this is everything you need to know. <laughs> he used that phrase all the time. This is everything you need to know and handed us a little peace program uh, brochure. I thought it was wonderful that Steve would hand out something like that because that was really a pretty bold step in the dog-eat-dog -dog litigation days that we were in in the late 80s. Only he could look at a, at a group of tenacious trial lawyers and say, you've been greedy pigs. You sold out for winning and for money. And that's not enough to sustain a life. Slowly but surely, as you start getting into it and understanding that there's, there, was an, there was another way to get something done other than beating someone to death at the courthouse. And then it's like a little light coming on one day saying, you know what, this is better. We had um, just observed a mediation, my first mediation that I'd actually seen from start to finish. And I was highly relieved at what I saw, that, that the process was not involving manipulation of the truth or deception, which the trial process does. And after 25,000 cases, we have a steady 80% success rate, regardless of who the mediator is. And that's important, because the miracle is not in the persona of the mediator, it's in the process. It is based on universal principles that Peace Pilgrim enunciated that were not original with her. And the basic underlying principle is that there is a spark of divine goodness in us all, and that there is a abiding desire to seek and achieve peace and harmony. I'm not the same person today that I was four or five years ago. I've seen people who hadn't seen me all this period of time. They say, you've changed. You're different. And I think for, for, uh, for the best. But that's as a result of, it's a result of finding peace. The thing about Peace for this message is it has a way of changing people's outlook in life and perspective in a way that I don't know of any other book that, that does it. And I believe that we can't even begin to know the effect that it's had. And that as time goes on, the respect and regard that she is given in our society is going to increase, and I think her influence will too. Things have changed a good deal since 1953, but I will say one thing has not changed, and that is my peace message. It still remains, this is the way of peace overcome evil with good and falsehood with truth and hatred with love. That's still the message 
uh, that I'm carrying after all these years. Well, you see, we haven't learned to live it yet. Peace Pilgrim, do you think that this one little effort can make a difference? I know that all good effort bears good fruit. And so I keep on making what good effort I can. I leave results in God's hands. They may not be manifest in my lifetime, but eventually they will be manifest. The key word for our times is really practice. When we do that, wonderful things will happen within our lives and within our world. I want to wish you all peace. She'd walk across America till they lay those weapons down. No one knew just what her age was, but her hair was silver gray. If you asked her what her name was, Peace Pilgrim, she would say.